Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, and once again, we have this great privilege here on EWTN on the Journey Home program to hear a journey, to hear a story of the good things that God has done in our lives. We're joined tonight by Andre and Angel Renier. Uh, Andre is a cradle Catholic. We'll hear more about his journey, his conversion as we go. And Angel is a former evangelical. And they're the founders of Catholic Christian Outreach, and their website is cco.ca. Thank you guys so much for being here yeah. to share your story Great tonight. To you. So excited to hear about <laughs> your journeys and how they intertwine, and also the, the awesome ministry you guys have been doing up in, up in Canada. Uh, some amazing, exciting stuff there. Some books we're going to talk about later. Just yeah. a lot to talk about tonight. So mm -hmm. I won't beat around the bush. I think we're going to start with you, Angel, okay. with your spiritual journey. Okay. Where does it begin? Well, I really was baptized Catholic, to be honest. Ah. But uh, my mom divorced quite quite early into my little childhood there. So when she remarried, all that happened very quickly, she had to leave the church. She just felt like, I can't get an annulment. So she she married a Lutheran gentleman, and I was raised in that place of faith. But it was through doing Luther's small catechism that my mother had her own personal conversion. Mm. And the charismatic renewal swept through Canada, and a whole bunch of things were happening in my family life of faith. So I would have grown up very faithfully. I would have had, um, church was a big part of our lives, our community, the whole Lutheran experience there growing up and a, a very strong conscience in my life. So that's how I grew up in a place that I was actually feeling very ostracized by my classmates. I was making many courageous decisions as a young person in a small town to follow the Lord. And so it was when I got to university that actually everything opened up for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that anybody my age was that faithful, was that into their faith. And then I discovered these groups like InterVarsity Christian Fellowship or the local Alliance Church or Campus Crusade for Christ. And I met so many of my peers that had one hour prayer times, that were going to church, that were going to college and career groups, that were going on missions, that were involved in small group faith studies. And these people were authentic. They were, they were my kind of people. And I was really drawn to them and I did everything that they invited me to because I wanted, I wanted the fullness, I wanted all of it. And Campus Crusade was really um, an important and pivotal place for me because I loved their, their strategy. Mm. They wanted to clearly proclaim Jesus to people, help them grow in their faith and then send them out to tell others yeah. in a very short amount of time. And their goal was actually to fulfill the Great Commission. And I was like, okay, tell me what to do and I will do it. I was very much wanting everything that they had to offer. So that's where my evangelical fervor was sitting, even mm -hmm. as I went into the, my last year of university. I was like, you know what, I think I could do this for the rest of my life. Yeah. I just love the university cli climate and I love doing mission here because these are the people that are making the decisions that will affect them for the rest of their lives. And so my faith came alive on campus, and I was like, I, I think I would keep doing this if I could. Yeah. But um, there's a Catholic undercurrent to all of that story. Mm -hmm. So because my of my mom's family background, which is French Canadian, there's this um, exposure to the Catholic Church, which was in my mind positive. I would have had an impression that many Catholics were maybe hoop jumping, were going with um, a lack of faith, but I also knew many who did have faith. And in particular, I have to say, um, my grandmother's sisters. So my grandmother's from Quebec, even though I was raised in the prairies. But she had five sisters that were, gr uh, sisters, yeah. <laughs> capital S sisters, with the Sisters of Charity of Montreal. And so my grandmother's sisters would come out west to visit my grandma. And these ladies were like, and Sleeping Beauty, like the little fairy godmothers that float around. Like, I, I think they could have floated while they walked. Like, they were just so adorable, so authentic. They definitely loved the Lord. They were so warm. And it was the beauty of their lives that really marked me as a young child. Um, every time they would visit, I'm getting emotional thinking about them. Um, they were just so pure and um, authentic. And so I had a real draw to them um, and every visit that, that they came. But then a very uh, providential moment happened when I was 14 that my, um, my parents bought a plane ticket for me, which was a big deal, 
to go to Quebec with my grandmother to visit her family. And in that visit with my angelic auntie <laughs> sisters, we went to the shrine of St. Joseph's Oratory in Montreal, which is the largest shrine to St. Joseph in the world. And as a prairie girl, I did not know churches could be that big. I didn't know churches could have escalators in them. <laughs> I didn't know that they could be that beautiful. And to go through that church in all of its majesty, to see the places where people would pilgrimage on their knees to pray, to see the votive room where there are crutches and crutches of people who were healed, uh, the candles. And all of that had um, a very um, fairy tale sort of experience for me. It's like going through a castle with these fairy godmothers in, in my life and my grandmother. And I was totally smitten with the Catholic experience. So even though I was this evangelical stream and the Lutheran background, yeah. the, the fascination in my mind as a young person with the piety of the Catholic Church was very beautiful. So if we're to speak of the transcendentals, the beauty is what yeah. attracted me to the point that I was even wondering, are there Lutheran nuns? Hmm. I was so captivated by it. In 1987, it, just before my last year of university, I was on a mission in Montreal with Camps Crusade for Christ. And as Providence would have it, I was living near the oratory. And so I would pass on the bus every day, twice a day in front of the oratory. And I was just like looking at this castle of a place. I would go there every chance I could to pray. I loved it. And so all of these things are brewing in my heart, this great affection for the Catholic Church. Christmas of 1987, there is a, uh, as Campus Crusade would tend to do, there'd be a Christmas conference for their college people. Sure. And as I'm driving there and I'm almost finished school, I'm almost going on to, you know, like my real world, I said to my best friend, um, I need to find a Frenchman to marry. She's like, okay. She knew exactly what I meant because my name is <laughs> really French, Angèle Marguerite, but because my father, who when we remarried, right, uh, it's a German last name, Hoffman. So it doesn't go together. It's just, I can't continue in life with this German last name. <laughs> so I said to her, I gotta find a French guy to marry, to make my life complete, but what am I gonna do? They're all Catholic. I'm never gonna meet one. And that is where um, Andre came in actually. Yeah. Because he happened to be at that conference and <laughs> happened to be on the stage giving a testimony. So when I heard huh. Andre Renier, I was like, I'm going to meet that guy. <laughs> and it worked out really great. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's, let's fill in the background and how, you know, all the way up to how you end up on that stage. Where did you? No, I just appeared yeah. on that stage. Just, just, that was, was where yeah, it began, there, right there. there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I grew sure. up just about 40 miles um, mm -hmm. west of where she's from. Uh, in a little bigger city uh, than she come from, but it was, I grew up in a French Catholic home. And we kind of, uh, us uh, French people, we like to ghettoize, so we, we had this little community. Our school was there, the cathedral was there. So everything I knew was Catholic. And for me personally, um, coming from a, a large family of eight children, um, I was spiritual inside. You know, my, my, you know, the sacraments had an impact on my life, uh, meaning I had a, this orientation, this desire for God. Um, and there was a couple, and I'm not going to talk about them uh, today, but pretty profound experiences of God that, you know, left a mark on my, on my life. So I was spiritual inside, yeah. um, but I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and so... Um, maybe inside I was spiritual, but the way I lived my life, there is nothing that would give testimony to, to my faith. You know, so what I did when I graduated is what everyone else did. Um, I just walked away from the church. Mm. It wasn't a conviction. I, you know, I don't want to go to mass. I just didn't wake up one Sunday morning and, um, uh, well, I woke up a little later. <laughs> um, and, and I just kind of never went back. Um, it was uneventful. Um, and so I was living a life uh, that was quite secular. I was engaged in the world. 
Um, and so, you know, there's lots of things going on in my life. I was a happy young man, I, you know, I pretty positive. I wasn't really in this great search of God, but he was still something that he, was, he mattered to me, you know, if I'd stopped and reflected. But it, it, God began to really work or call me back, um, you know, when I had a conversation with this girl that I liked, we were dating, and one day, she, you know, we're in a coffee shop, and she says, Andre, I met another guy, and he's really great. And I said, well, I'm great, too. Um, but she said, no, he's a Christian. And I said, well, I'm a Christian. You know, this is my moment to kind of give testimony. I'm a Catholic, you know, this is what's really in my heart. But she says, no, he's a real Christian. And I knew at that moment, as I reflect back, it was almost like the Lord um, revealed the state of my soul. Yeah. I, I recognize that, that um, I was far away. So a week later, um, we were, um, it was Sunday night, and... Uh, my friends and I were going to go to a movie. Um, we we're going to grab something to eat and then go to a movie. And one of my best friends said, well, I'm going to go to Mass before and I'll meet you after. And I looked at him, but inside the, what was going on for me, I was I, yelling inside saying, I want to make that choice. Why didn't I choose that? That, that represents me. Like I am spiritual inside and I wanted to make that decision. And at that moment, it was like the Holy Spirit was revealing to me the desire of my heart. Um, so a couple weeks later, mm. I find myself way up north, I'm gonna, you know, up in Fort McMurray, Alberta, to make some money in the oil fields. And so I got there on, a, uh, I think, Saturday morning. And... Uh, because we didn't have, you know, um, Google search, you know, um, <laughs> I had to go to the thing called um, a phone book, a Yellow Pages, and look, and I tried to find a, a Catholic Mass, and I found one. I found out that it, it a Mass at a certain time, so the next day I went, I just happened to be a couple blocks away, and I went to Mass that day, because I want to go. Um, I wanted him to be a priority. I didn't know what that meant. But I just wanted them to be a priority in my life. And so I went to Mass that day. I, I would describe kind of lost, spiritually lost. But at one particular time um, in, in the liturgy, obviously, not knowing where, at what point, um, it was almost like, well, it was like a, a St. Paul experience. It's, it's like the presence of God just kind of fell upon me. It's like every cell of my body was filled with the love of God. I was, I was just so like captured in my, I was so emotional and just, you know, wandering on this moment to the point where I actually began to shake. And I left Mass that day. Um, well, like I said, I went in there lost. I came out found. The first thing I did when I got into my car as I began to sing, the only thing I, the only response I had to this moment was to sing. So I began to sing the old songs like, make me a channel of your peace. You still know we are Christians by our love. It was all these songs I learned growing up. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened that day was a metanoia, a conversion of my heart. Because I was going this way and I ended up going that way. But for the next five years... I believed I was the only Catholic that felt this way. I, I didn't have EWTN. I didn't have, you know, movements. I didn't have a parish priest or even a family that could kind of guide me in any way in my Catholic faith. But I, I stayed true to it. Yeah. Um, and, but I prayed every day. I began to read my Bible and, and made some life choices. It's almost like I knew how to be converted. Um, and, uh, but I, I wrestled for the University of Saskatchewan. I did fairly well. I was hoping to go to the Olympics, didn't go. <laughs> Let's don't talk about that. Okay? <laughs> um, but but there's a couple evangelical um, uh, Christians on my team that were good friends. We're all good friends. And um, so they invited me to come to their college and career uh, Friday night events. And um, I, I was 
really moved by how many girls that were there <laughs> and how many people. I mean, um, moved spiritually. Yes, just very spiritually. Spiritual. <laughs> yes, um, but. <laughs> It was a real transformative moment. It's almost like the Holy Spirit was yeah. was giving me a vision for my future. Because what caught me was how they loved Jesus. He was so real to them. They spoke of him as if he was a friend. And I'd never, never heard my parents or you know, this is back in the 70s and 80s, the church, 60s and 70s. Church is a lot different in Canada back then. And so this is new, but it was what I was experiencing. So it kind of resonated mm -hmm. to me. But the second, uh, you know, kind of um, ethos, I, you know, what I was hearing, what they were talking about, was that, that they were missionary by nature. You could see that all they wanted to do was tell people about this relationship with Jesus. They're, they're sharing the, their faith on, on the universities. Uh, they were going you know, to different countries. They were sharing, um, they're evangelizing their families. You know, they were just captured and they didn't want to keep it to themselves. And I knew that that was true. I knew that made sense, that that was, should be our response. But again, this wasn't my experience as a Catholic. Right. But what had the biggest impact on my life was it seemed like every second Protestant was an ex-Catholic. They would say to me, oh, yeah, I used to be Catholic. Now I have a personal relationship with Jesus. I'm saved, whatever language they used. And, but you know, as I was listening to them, I wanted to drop to my knees and beg them to come back. Come back, please. We need your zeal. We need your missionary zeal. We need your love for Jesus in my parish. But as I was begging them to come back in my heart, I'd say, where would I take them mm. that would match their, their present experience? Because my parish wasn't doing it. I mean, I was there faithfully, but there was not a lie. And there, nothing. What I was experiencing wasn't matching what they were experiencing. Mm. And it was at that moment that I, that I, I, not exactly in these words, but just was, God, I want to do something about this. Like, I, I, I want to stop the bleeding, you know. And, um, and so a number of things happened over the next couple of years that got me to this conference. Mm -hmm. I'd, um, I'd been involved in Athletes in Action, and I went on a, on, um, on a mission way, way up north. And it was, you know, just before Christmas, before the conference, in the Yukon. Yeah, in the Yukon. And I, um, they shared with me, you know, the vision or the mission, the Great Commission. And the Holy Spirit just captured my, mo my heart at that moment, the Great Commission, and, and the need for the church to, to strive to fulfill that Great Commission. And uh, I was, like, so captured by mission, by evangelization. And back then it was not cool, you know, to be, talk about evangelization in the Catholic Church mm. in 1987 was like, you know, it was, it was like a foreign language, mm. um, offensive for some. Anyway, so I was asked to give a testimony and, and, um, mm. and then about, after I gave my testimony, I went down into you know, the crowd and she came up and introduced herself and yeah. The rest is history. And which conference was this? What was the? It was a Campus Crusade for Campus Christ Crusade, okay. conference. So, yeah. so that's where you met. That's yeah. where this, we met. This testimony. Yeah. yeah. So. But you almost left the church, actually. You were on the cusp in the, well, well, around 1987. Okay. I, I guess, yeah. I mean, there's so much in sure, that. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can, I can share a little bit about that, you know. Um, is that I, of course, my, I had no Catholic friends. And I, mm. I believe it was God's intention that he would put me in the desert that way in regards yeah. to being a Catholic. But I never, ever felt this desire to become a, a Protestant, uh, going to evangelical church until, I, I'm not too sure exactly what summer it was, but I was at home working, uh, making money, so I'd go back to school. Um, but I remember, you know, just pray, I prayed every day, and I remember, you know, just saying, like, why am I Catholic? Like, you know, it's, it's almost like I, I no, nobody was speaking to me, encouraging me to, to want to stay Catholic or like the mysteries, uh, you know, and the great gift that we have. So I just took it for granted. Mm -hmm. um,
but it was this some but I had no intention of leaving but this summer I was praying and um, I went to the passage um, in Matthew 10 where it says he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy to follow me and at that moment I said Lord I'm not going to stay Catholic because of my family mm -hmm. or my uncle who's a priest who had a great influence in my life um, I'm I felt the Lord is inviting me to make a choice at that moment mm -hmm. that him before my family mm -hmm. and so I made a, de a decision then it's in August of whatever summer it was mm -hmm. so I made a decision I would go to Circle, Dr Circle Drive Alliance Church mm -hmm. When there was a girl there that I, I liked, but um, so I, I made that decision. I went um, and I was staying in residence. And uh, the first week, we kind of gathered in the residence. A, a number of us on my floor gathered in my my. Uh, I had a big uh, room, and um, there was about fifteen of us. And of course, I set up my room. I had the crucifix and a, a picture of Mary and you know like I had it was all there like mm -hmm. all everything my mom gave me and it was kind of <laughs> yeah. a little altar yeah. and uh, at the end I don't know um, anyway this guy came up to me after and he said so you're a Christian I said uh, yeah and I thought he was another Christian I just I met lots of them so then he he said he's a Catholic um, and um, soon as I I heard that and he started saying how he, you know, he's really into Medjugorje and, you know, Father Bob Bedard. Um, I know you guys ha had Father Bishop Scott McKay, you know, mm -hmm. the Companions of the Cross, mm -hmm. and, you know, how he loved Jesus. And I'm going, what? He's a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And I never did go to the, to the Circle Drive Alliance Church. I never actually made, but I made the decision in August that I would be faithful to God. Yeah. And he said, okay, thank you. And now he introduced me to Paul Urach, yeah. and um, and uh, you know it's kind of I didn't need to go there anymore. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's a little bit of mm -hmm. my story. Um, you know. Yeah, you know that, that's it's an important turning point. I think that many cradle Catholics go through at some point, which is like to let go of even to let go of the church in the sense of my own reasons for being Catholic. I mean, I experienced that a little bit in my life, you know, that why am I Catholic? Is it just because this is the most comfortable place for me to be, given my upbringing? You know, or am I really open to what the truth is? And, and that can be a scary moment for people when they, they have that moment of, God, what do you really want from me? What, what really is true outside of my comfort zone? Um, on the other side of that, you know, for you was God giving back to you what you had, but now in a new way, yeah. and that's a mm -hmm. really beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah, it was... It's a, a beautiful journey. And yeah. We look back and you, you can see, you can see how, one, God, um, and the sacraments actually do make a difference in our lives. Mm -hmm. we, we might not know it, but I, you know, much of what I experienced, I know it was grace. Mm -hmm. And my desire for God, my, my intimate, like real private, my private life, there's an intimacy there, a profound sense of why Jesus died for us, you know? Yeah. I just knew it as a child. Mm -hmm. Well, that's grace, and I, I believe that's the grace of the sacraments. Um, and, you know, it led us to this moment. But yeah. one thing, you know, just as we're talking here, I think, okay, my conversion, and then my, you know, really beginning to, you know, enter and, and serve the church as best as I can as a layperson, um, where, where uh, the Lord captured my heart mm -hmm. was, was the, the missionary thrust needed in the church that was lacking. Right. It's, it's almost like the Great Commission it seemed to be something that, uh, at least from my perspective, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't talked about or central to kind of yeah. what we're called to as Catholics. The Holy Spirit stirred that in my heart, and mm -hmm. all I wanted to do is talk to every Catholic in the world yeah. about about Jesus, mm -hmm. and especially my family. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's you know, thirty five mm -hmm. years later, this is who we are. Yeah. Well, and we can hear it, but we need to see it lived out in other people. Yeah. yeah. So you guys met. What what happened next after that? 
Well, at that conference, they were not only having a conference, but they were also going out into the, the West Edmonton Mall, which is like the, one of the largest malls. It's even bigger than the Mall of the mm -hmm. Americas. And we were doing evangelization. And one of my friends who's Catholic in Campus Crusade went with Andre doing evangelization in the mall, like very scary. But I remember Andre coming back from that experience that I had done, you know, dozens of times. And he was so on fire about um, what he was able to do with a very short amount of time with the right tool of what he could do. And I'm observing, here's two Catholic young men that can actually do a ton because so many people you're gonna encounter are Catholic. We're the biggest Christian denomination in Canada that they have so much to offer. So in getting to meet Andre at the conference and um, yeah, kind of being cute about it and everything, um, he actually needed a ride back to Saskatoon. He had no ride back. His best friend kind which of is ditched him. A, uh, <laughs> we're in Edmonton, which is four hours, away, six hours away from where I need to go. Gotcha. And the person that was supposed to drive me to Saskatoon <laughs> decided not to go to Saskatoon. Just stranded him so in the moment. So I, I was crying out to the Lord. No. Okay, they were having a fight actually in the lobby. Uh, not a physical fight, but they were, they were arguing in the lobby. Mm. So my friend and I were actually going to stay in Edmonton to go to a dance and then drive back to Saskatoon. So I said, hey, we have room in our car, but we're sticking around. So that worked out great for him, for us, for uh, actually for <laughs> for the world, because that was our <laughs> first date. And uh, we, we moved back to Saskatoon. So our conversations that ensued, both of us in our last semester of university, is about uh, zeal, essentially. It's Andre experiencing the tools that could help him, uh, me sharing about like, yeah, I've seen it work. Like, why don't you lead faith studies with Catholics on campus and just do it for Catholics by Catholics? And he's like, hey, how do I do that? So I give him the books, I set him up to do it. So he gathered some guys, one, two of whom went on to become Catholic priests, actually. Um, I happened to be working with girls that were from mainline churches, Catholics and Lutherans, that I was evangelizing, and I just really loved working with them because they were so hungry and they had so little Whereas in the evangelical world, we have so many resources and knowledge. So the little things I was giving them were, were making such a big impact. So we're going back and forth, sharing about ministry, essentially. Mm -hmm. And his zeal to do something more for Catholics on campus was growing and growing. And also the Lord had put into his life um, at about that time, just a little earlier, the local parish priest who happened to be a charismatic uh, leading figure in the Western Canadian Church, uh, Father Claire Watron, who's a bazillion. Going to be a pre uh, 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 saint. The man will be a saint. You can know that it was said here for the first time <laughs> on public television. Um, but Father Claire was uh, evangelistic to the heart. And so when he met Andre, he, was, he knew what to do with a guy with this kind of fervor. He was very ecumenical. He was very open-minded and he wanted to do mission. And in fact, at his parish, he was sending people out door to door doing evangelization and just in the 80s. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So it's, really crazy. Yeah. Very orthodox priest also. Mm -hmm. just <laughs> Very yeah. orthodox. Um, yeah. He, he loved the church, loved Mary, loved the Eucharist. And uh, anyway, he, was, he was an awesome, awesome priest. So he, he really pastored Andre. And then I'm coming into the scene as this uh, girlfriend at this point. Mm -hmm. And we're just talking ministry. We're talking about what could be done for university students. What could be done that we could kind of cut and paste from the evangelical um, strategies and make this into a Catholic context. And this is kind of going on, but I have to say, like, quite quickly into the relationship, within weeks, I was aware of the fact that I'm dating a Catholic here. Mm-hmm. And I'm about to join staff with Campus Crusade for Christ. Like I'm at a, I'm at a fork in the road. I, I can't just keep pretending that this isn't going to cause any problems. So I asked Father Claire for help to make um, a quicker decision about my understanding of the Catholic Church because Andre had just lived this experience that he just shared, and he was like, "I am never leaving the Catholic Church." In the evangelical world, everybody switches churches all the time. That's right. what I was, so you just kind of pick what flavor was working for you. So I wasn't surprised to have to change churches. But for Andre, he's like, he would never change. I'm like, okay, so I need to consider this and we're gonna have to do some thinking. Mm -hmm. Will I actually be able to consider a Catholic life? 
because I don't want to just date for no, for just any old reason. Let's actually take a break there. Leave a nice cliffhanger note. Yeah. Maybe we can figure out how that uh, how that resolved itself, you know, in, in your terms okay. of your spiritual journey. We'll be back in just a couple minutes here, uh, hearing more from Andre and Angel Renier, and we're also going to hear, you know, toward the end of the show, we'll hear b- more about their ministry, the Catholic Christian Outreach, CCO.ca. We'll be back in just a minute to hear the rest of their story. See you then. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight, speaking with Andre and Angel Renier. Uh, Andre is a cradle Catholic. Angel is a former evangelical. They're the founders of Catholic Christian Outreach, which we'll hear more about in a little bit. And when we left off, uh, you guys have uh, started up this relationship. You've connected over the zeal for sharing the gospel, you know, for telling people about Jesus, telling people about uh, about uh, the gospel message, the good news. Uh, but now you're just you're just realizing that there there, there might be a little question of what do we do with this catholic thing yeah what do we do with the catholic thing yeah yes and so father claire watcher and this this awesome uh pastor at the nearby parish he did three things i I would zero in on that were really um helpful for me to make a decision say yes to the church keeping in mind that i have this very fairy tale fascination with catholic piety Mm -hmm. the first thing is that he gave me um a book catholic and christian by dr alan schreck Great book. Which was perfect. Yeah. Misconceptions evangelicals have about the Catholic Church. And so the first thing I did is I skipped ahead to the chapter on salvation. What does the church teach about the kerygma, essentially? And, uh, you know, the, the misconceptions that Protestants would have about that are pretty strong. And, of course, it was such a strong part of my identity as a Campus Crusade person. I need to know I could be in sync with this. And Dr. Schreck's explanation was so easy to receive. I was like, I can, I can buy that. I remember dropping the chapter and just going like, I can, I can be into that. And then I started reading the rest of the book. <laughs> so that book was very helpful. And it, it almost like within whatever, the two or three hours it took to read it, kind of solved all the big issues. Father Claire Watson prepared me to join the church, which happened um, quite shortly. Just to give a little bit of context, from the moment I introduced myself to Andre, to the moment we began our movement was 10 months, 10 months. So a lot of things happened. So it's not hard to remember the chronology because there's only 10 months to to figure it out with. But uh, Father Claire, when I decided I would join the church, uh, because we were engaged, yes, that all happened very quickly. (laughs) um, He did basically a tailor-made RCIA for me because I had actually been taking Catholic classes at the university because I had an attraction to the church. And the part I found the hardest was actually um, Mary. And I was like, okay, I can respect it, but I kind of don't get it. Mm -hmm. And it was Fatima and all the newspaper articles and the eyewitnesses that really nipped that together. I was like, okay, okay, I can get behind that. That is (laughs) kind of scientifically proven here. So that really was uh, helpful for me. And then the third thing was the mission happening in the parish. The way Father Claire's heart was so missionary, the way that he uh, put John Paul II encyclicals in the parish of Narthex, <laughs> that we uh, both, we read John Paul II, we, we read everything that he wrote, Father Claire would speak about him. And I am seeing a parish that is doing door-to-door evangelization, a priest who preaches clearly a conversion to Christ, leads retreats, and the Holy Father speaking those same evangelistic themes that I knew I could make a home here Mm -hmm. because my life was going to be mission. Had it been any other place, I think, Mm -hmm. uh, there's only one other parish I can think of in Canada at that time, and that's where Father Bob Bedard was. I don't think any other Catholic context would have been ready for the zeal that we were bringing, for Andre as well. To pop us with all of that uh, popping energy (laughs) into any other context would have been, Mm -hmm. I think, a disaster. But the Lord wanted something to grow, and he he put our seeds in good soil. 
and and we really were able to grow there and i was mm -hmm. able to say yes to the church so easily because of those factors yeah. so even i would say beauty still attracted because mm -hmm. it was the truths that father claire was demonstrating through his parish the things that he taught me the books mm -hmm. that he gave me but it was i saw the beauty in it yeah i saw how beautiful it was and i was like yeah this is this is the total package here actually yeah. if it's lived well this is the total package mm -hmm. so a little bit of rose-colored glasses because we all know that the church has a lot of struggles mm -hmm. but the lord was really good because he wanted something to grow and he made yeah. it happen yeah, from the the earliest days of the church you know, that's how it spread. It, it wasn't because they, they had it all laid out in tracts and documents and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the teachings of the churches because they met, people met Christians. Uh, and so we have to keep those two axes in mind in terms of evangelization. There's the stuff, there's the truth, and we want people to share that mm -hmm. and embrace that. But they have to see it lived out. It has, yeah. to, it has to make a difference in a person's life and then that you have to, you have to be, you have to embody the gospel. Yeah, uh, yeah one, one yeah. you know, um, kind of understanding that we've come to learn over the years, but but it was lived out in very, uh, like it's almost innocent ways. It was just naive. We didn't really know what we were wrestling with. But as we kind of began to study and understand this idea of the kerygma, the importance of the gospel, and, and this idea of conversion, um, you know, and we really spoke a lot about that in those early years because something that is much different in Canada than it is down here is that you guys still kind of it's it's fine to be Christian it's actually a benefit you know politically um, and it, you guys are comfortable with being a Christian country although that's eroding but it, it had eroded in Canada um, and so we were highly secular you know, and so the people, we didn't have the, the really strong, you know, um, Catholic apologists and, mm -hmm. you know, um, that were really forming our people. People might not respond, but, but in, in America, everyone kind of knows, you know, if you grew up, it, you know, in the church, you kind of yeah. know your, your theology. Well, in Canada, you don't, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and so the people, the Catholics had to, had to be re-evangelized. And so conversion, transformation um, is what in Canada, and I think more and more in the States, is something that, that God needs to do in a person's life. And, and John Paul II talked about that all the time, yeah. the need for a metanoia, you know, Pope Benedict talked about, you know, that the faith is not just, you know, a bunch of rules and ethics, but it is an event, you know, uh, you know, a, 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 an encounter with a person yeah. that changes your life. And, and this, you know, again, for Angela as an evangelical, that made sense. Okay, yeah, that, that rings true. So what we have found over the years, and, and we bump into evangelicals and, you know, uh, quite often, and they are shocked that that we as Catholics mm -hmm. would kind of emphasize the kerygma, Jesus and conversion. But the thing that is different between like a, a, what we've kind of discovered and we're, uh, you know, we, the way we look at conversion or giving your life to Jesus is not a not necessarily an issue of salvation, but an issue of relationship a transformation and so God is inviting us to live that relationship so saying yes to Jesus is not necessary for a Protestant might be a salvation issue mm -hmm. but for us it's more of a relational but and, I, and the but is really important for many Catholics it does become a salvation issue mm -hmm. because like me I had wandered far away from the heart of God and yeah. so yeah anyway um, in a relationship, you're either growing closer or you're falling away. Right? Yeah. There's not you can't really st be stable in it. You have to be progressing. And so, with yeah. a relationship with God, we can't just be comfortable coasting along. We have to be yeah. growing in that relationship, mm -hmm. pursuing God, uh, allowing ourselves to be pursued by God. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. what happened next after that? 
that summer yeah. of me being prepared for the church, mm. we got married October 15th. October the 18th was the first day we had a faith study on campus. The in-between was me preparing. Basically, we started the movement October 18th. Gotcha. That's when it started. We got married on October 15th. Wow. I mean, our first, first, you know, gathering of a crowd, a, a small group of people, was three days after we got married. That's what it was. Why do we know that? Because we weren't there. We had to delegate <laughs> oh, because we were gotcha. on a honeymoon. <laughs> so we think that's really profound because it isn't about us. It's not right. about our personality because right. we really don't right. have a personality. Yeah. <laughs> but it's about actually empowering people, which mm -hmm. is which is what we want. We want yeah. to raise up missionary disciples who have the goods to yeah. go and to reach others. And uh, so in the summer, I prepared um, a simple faith study with Father Claire Watcher, and that would be the kind of principles or, or steps that someone could take to lead someone to Christ and help mm -hmm. them start growing that relationship with Christ that Father Claire was helping me work through, which was very similar, honestly, to what the old school Life in the Spirit seminar curriculum would have been. Mm -hmm. So it was very basic things. And so we created that with a lot of scripture and... Um, good questions to help Catholics start to understand like how they can say a yes to the Lord, start following him, daily prayer, daily scripture, fellowship, service, witness, the sacraments. All those things are just like wrapped up in this small little six week faith study. Yeah. That was the beginning of what we did. And then that first year of starting, actually I taught in the Catholic school board and Andre was uh, on campus and it, it really grew. And there was another group in the States that was also doing stuff in Arizona who had also had Camps Crusade experience was doing stuff. And we're like, oh my goodness, we want to be as big as he is. He was on four campuses. So uh, we said to Father Claire, like, do you think Angel can go on campus too? I'm talking about myself in the third person. <laughs> do you think I can go on campus too? And he was like, okay, let's do it. But that meant we had to start living by providence. Mm. So mm. we had to begin support raising for our salaries, which is akin to the model that Protestant organizations would do. Nobody in the Catholic Church lives like that. Although now there's more and more. Right. There are so many that do now. Yeah. We were definitely pioneering. Yeah. Um, we were doing everything that that had never been done before. Yeah. Evangelization and support raising, being full-time lay evangelists. Um, it, it was all new. We were creating new materials as we went. But that's that's how it began. That's how it started growing. And um, now we're on 17 campuses across Canada. But I don't yeah. know. What can we say at this point? Yeah, yeah. It's you know the the objective, um, and again, I think this this is a, a really important point, and and I think that the Angers crossing, uh, you know, coming home, if you will, mm -hmm. was an easy one because she understood that the church, although back then, you know, the words of John Paul II hadn't kind of entered into the psyche of the church, you know. Yeah. Um, but that the emphasis on mission, on evangelization and the gospel, it kind of made sense, the, the, the crossover. But we've seen that in Canada. We've mm -hmm. se we're seeing more and more evangelicals. The crossover, the, the, the move um, to become Catholic becomes a, a lot easier because they see our missionary zeal, the same zeal that yeah. they have. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, yes, they had to wrestle with some theological issues, you know, but but it was a nature thing for them. The Great Commission isn't just a task; it's it's kind of part of who they are. Well, interesting enough, if you read the uh, you know the teachings of the Church, we are missionary by nature. Yeah. You know, evangelization, as John Paul II said it, and Pope Benedict emphasized it more and more. It's a, it's our deepest identity. Mm -hmm. Well. So, you know, Angèle coming over, her nature, her, her evangelical nature matched up so nicely with, mm -hmm. you know, the Catholic nature, which is missionary by, yeah. you know, and, um, and so, so yeah, it, it um, again, back, back in 1988, it was, we were kind of on the outside looking in. It's like, we were, we were talking about conversion and having a personal relationship and, and you know, God wants intimacy with us, which is just like let's open up the the truth of the sacraments. You know, like it's I mean, God wants relationship, and He wants us to be like fully captured by that relationship. Um, well, that was that was our comfort with Jesus was almost offensive 
to many people, they're uncomfortable with, you know, our love for Jesus, which, again, let's just look at the sacraments, um, who, who they are. Um, and, um, but we kind of had to stay the course. And the person that rooted us the most in staying the course in those first 10 years, it was, it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. It was, again, we were on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. But what kept us sane, what kept us focused is St. John Paul II the Great. I read everything he said over and over again. The language we use as a movement when it comes to evangelization, mission, relationship, you know, our zeal, you know, it's like it's you I've underlined it under, you know, and John Paul II said it. I'm now saying it. Um, but in, for the first 10 years of the movement, it was kind of like, why are you talking like that? Yeah. Well, because John Paul II talked like that. And Benedict talked like that. Um, so anyway, so it was an interesting, um, a very exciting time, but very difficult and challenging time in those first 10 years. You know, division in the church, in the body of Christ, is due to sin, individual and all of, all of our sin in some mysterious way, right? But I, I, God uses that, you know, in his great grace and mercy, he uses that, I think, sometimes to bring, you know, through the division to bring back charisms, to bring back gifts, to highlight things that we've begun to forget, and certainly Catholics have gotten, you know, their, this this point. You know, it's it's all there in, in Catholic theology. It's mm. in there in the teaching. It's in there in the devotional, but the actual living of it has so often gone gone stale. It's gone out, and you and we've we've had evangelicals, you know, who have, you know, brought that highlighted that and brought it back in through their mm. conversion. And so to connect on that level yeah. with other people who who yeah. see that. Yeah. yeah, and I don't think I don't think the priests and I mean the bishop was very supportive of us, and so we were very in line with, um, you know what what the you know we're at the heart of the church. But I think it wasn't even they were angry or sinful, but I think they're just ignorant of what they were unaware of what mm -hmm. what um, what the Holy Spirit was doing after Second Vatican Council. You know mm -hmm. something that John Paul II said that was very profound, and I've. I wrote a book on it, The Catholic Missionary Identity, yeah. but he used a line and he says, um, a radical conversion of thinking is required for individuals and the community for us to become missionary. Mm -hmm. And he said this back in 1989, uh, uh, yeah. um, meaning there needs to be a, a new way of thinking mm -hmm. about our missionary nature. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think it just, you know, they, their minds needed to be changed. And I, yeah. as a movement, we're working a lot in dioceses and, and parishes throughout Canada and the United States and big dioceses here in, in your country. And I'm, I'm so encouraged that the missionary thrust that they, they see necessary today uh, and their, their courage and their conviction to, to, to embrace it um, is to me a, a sign of the springtime that St. John Paul II talked mm -hmm. about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. the erosion of the church um, in these past three decades, when we began, it, it was status quo. Everybody was basically decently Catholic to some degree. So no one understood why we were making an emphasis on this conversion of heart. But because things are so different now, the church is more aware that there is actually no faith. It's yeah. not even a vestige of faith. So, yeah. so that's great, actually. That, that makes me very excited because then that puts um, an urgency, the urgency that John Paul II spoke about. Now we feel it palpably. And what are we going to do about it? Mm. And we're concerned for our loved ones. We're concerned for the youth. We're concerned for, the, for everyone's future. Mm -hmm. And so it gives people a desire to know, how do, I, how do I communicate my faith? And, well, where do I start? Mm -hmm. Because the Catholic faith is so big. How, do I get caught up on an issue? Right. And we would say, uh, after doing 35 years of campus ministry, actually to kind of like avoid the issues, actually, bring them to Jesus. Mm. And we have seen over and over again that through a personal, authentic witness and a clear proclamation of the cross and an invitation for someone to open their lives to Jesus, yeah. and that causes a change, the issues 
90 percent of the time just fade away i think that's a really good point I just, just just quickly i mean i think so often the conversations inside and outside the church don't go anywhere because you're putting things out of order right yeah. you're going to argue with somebody on, on a top level issue when the disagreements are so so much deeper yeah. right and to, you have to get to the heart of the issue which is that if, if if we don't know who jesus is then how can we expect to be converted on any of the other issues yes so start and with jesus am i yeah. loved Yes. And is there mercy for me? Because I know what I've messed up mm, in my right. life. So everybody has their own heart at the bottom of the story, mm -hmm. regardless of the issue or yeah. even theory about the kerygma. Yeah. It's am I loved and is there mercy? And one, yeah. of the, one of the fruits of conversion, and we're seeing this in Canada, but uh, yeah, it's, it's global. It's, it's not even a Canadian reality, but I, I believe it's a global opportunity, <laughs> is um, you don't even have to convince them, give them a case for for the sacraments or the church. Yeah. They, the Holy Spirit just naturally, they embrace the sacraments. I'm, I'm shocked and we don't even have to spend a lot of time talking to them about you know, the church. They just naturally you know, are attracted to it. It's the fruits uh, of the Spirit, exactly. right? The understanding, the yeah. zeal for God, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so you know, we don't, we don't even, like in all our faith studies that we have, which Angel um, built them, uh, uh, wrote them, is it introduces the sacraments at the right place and throughout, you know, then the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. And, um, but what, what happens is that they, they go now to other books and programs and, you know, blogs and, and they start talking. So we're giving them like just a, a little bit, you know, there's a thread of information and, and opportunity. But they, they add on to it. They bring the flesh because they're so hungry for more. We don't have to, we don't have to provide it because they go get it. Right. You know, and so it's, it's really exciting to see how you know, solidly mm -hmm. Catholic, how captured they are by their, their, their Catholic life and their embracing of the Catholic life and their vocations. But we don't even have to. We almost just... Here's here's the you know the all the food here. Here's the table. It's set for you, and they they just go and and pick the, not picking what they want, but they just yeah. they they say I want more of this. I mean, I want you know tell me more about that. You know, and it's really exciting to see. It's easy to 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 accompany people after conversion. Yeah, yeah. yeah introduce them yes. to Jesus. We, we're almost out of time here, I so know. I want to make sure, like, very briefly, uh, you know, where can people find more information, mm -hmm. you know, some books they should look up, some things they should check out. And then, again, if you would, for those who are listening who maybe, this sounds pretty great, like, I, I want to know Christ like that, give a word of encouragement mm -hmm. to them, if you could do those two yeah. things. Well, we're at cco.ca. Sure. And on there, you can find a whole bunch of things about our movement, mm -hmm. but our store is there, so you can find some of our books. Mm -hmm. There's this face study series that mm -hmm. we're talking about. There's the little, um, it's called the Ultimate Relationship Booklet. And there's been over a million in print. Mm -hmm. It's a gospel tract. So for those who have an evangelical background and, and know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. now here's a Catholic gospel, gospel tract, tract with imprimatur. It's, <laughs> it's the real deal. And it is effective in helping you communicate Jesus to other people. Wonderful. We have some other books, one about our family, actually. All, our entire family wrote a book together, every single chapter, which was no small feat, let me just say, <laughs> about how to raise children who will be missionary disciples, who won't just be basically Catholic, but will actually be alive and vibrant in it. And we have, Andre has some books on evangelization, clear and simple. We have a book about intentional accompaniment, how to walk with people, because it's not just a program that does the work. Right. It's, Right. It's someone with someone mm -hmm. walking them through mm -hmm. it. And then I wrote a book on forgiveness. So Wonderful. There's a lot of things there. CCO. CCO.ca for C Canada. Got yeah, right. CCO.ca. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm sure we have people out there, Catholics and some non-Catholics. Well, Catholics who, who maybe wish they had a relationship with Jesus like that, who maybe they haven't heard the gospel proclaimed quite like that. Maybe some non-Catholic Christians who are like, hey, that, you're talking my language. Mm -hmm. A word of encouragement to them to continue the journey. Yeah. Yeah. I... I, I yeah, you know, the way I would encourage them is, one, we know, um, and I'm giving testimony, that the fullness of faith is found in the Catholic Church. It, it just, it's my experience. But at the heart of it is exactly their experience with Jesus, that conversion that they, you know, you refer to words like born again or, you know, um, that, you know, I've, my heart is converted. Now I know 
Jesus in a personal way, and, and I want the world to, to know. Like, this is what you've been taught, what, you've, what you know, has rung true to you. I want you to know that what I, what Angers experienced, what I've experienced is that this is at the heart of the church. By, by our very nature, we are who you are. Um, and then once you step in, everything about the church um, is not, uh, it's, it's exactly what your heart has been longing for. The intimacy, the richness, the tradition, um, the truth, the scriptures coming alive, everything is, is there um, you know, for, for the taking. And uh, so don't be afraid. Know that we are um, we're just like you yeah. uh, when it comes to Jesus. Yeah. Be not afraid. Press on. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Andre, Angel. Thanks. Thank you for sharing your story, and thank you for your awesome ministry. We'll be praying for it. Keep up the great work. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home Program. Again, why why do we do this show? What's the point here? It's not just to, you know, confirm ourselves as Catholics. Oh, this isn't great what the Catholic Church teaches, and we're Catholic. No, it's about conversion. We're hearing people who have come to know Jesus and have found the fullness that he wants to give them in the Catholic Church. And that's, that's why we're here. It's about conversion. I'm on a journey. You're on a journey. Let's continue that journey together. We'll be back again next week with another story. See you then. God bless.